Good morning, everyone. Can I put my glasses on now that my mask is off? Good to see you here. It's always a pleasure uh, to uh, join with you in worship. And I pray that uh, as we gather together and we hear the word, we listen to music and we pray together, that this will be a blessing to you. It's, it's, still, it's still a difficult time in, in the world, and it is good to, be, to remember that we have our loving God always with us. For those of you who, will be, who are joining us through video, I also welcome you, and I pray that uh, you will feel connected to us, and through the Holy Spirit, you will feel uh, worship in your heart and in your home as you see this video, uh, listen to the things that it has to say. And so thank you for joining us as well. I don't have any announcements today so um, that I can think of, and uh, so that being said, uh, would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for this day. The sunshine is beautiful. Um, Lord, we, we, we're, we're looking forward to uh, spring and to be able to do things in the garden and to just uh, feel the sun on our faces. It just seems, at least to me, almost extra special this year. It reminds me, Lord God, that no matter what happens around us, and, and this is easier said than done, but Lord, you are still there, and beauty is still around us. We thank you that everything that you represent, Lord God, cannot be shaken, cannot be thrown to the side, cannot be uh, restricted. Uh, you have... Uh, no restrictions on your presence. Pray that we would remember this more than just something cute a minister would say, but that it is rock solidly true. And so we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you minister to each and every one of us in our particular situations, but also in our situation as a community of faith. That we would turn to you personally and that we would work together communally uh, for your purposes. And may it be that we are reminded yet again today how beautiful you are and how much uh, your presence means to us uh, no matter what happens in our life. I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much, Adam. I so appreciate you and what you bring uh, to our worship. Did their uh, love and sorrow meet in or thorns? Huh? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Hmm? Let me read scripture. Honest to goodness, I think this year has made me even more weepy than normal, which is quite a lot to say, but... Let me read to you from Matthew 27 and starting at verse 32. And uh, the scripture, the the words of Christ that um, I've chosen for today are, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they are recorded in Matthew. So it says this, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, My God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your hearing, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, let me continue then with this series, Words to Live By. They are the words that are recorded in the Gospels, spoken by Jesus at his crucifixion. And I think every single one of us here would understand that when I say words to live by, it's because what he said on the cross echoes and reverberates in who we are today and how we are to live. Though we are not Jesus and could not carry out his task, we are guided by him and through the Holy Spirit caused to be like him in every way. And so these words are important More than just simply said because Jesus said them, they are alive. I think the words today that I'm teaching on, preaching on today, my God, my God, it can be Eli, Eli, or Eloi, Eloi. El is the word for God. These are probably the most perplexing of the words that Jesus said from the cross. And perhaps some of the most, if not the most perplexing thing he said. I'm going to tell you now, (laughs) there's no perfect answer to why Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I tell you why. There is all kinds of theological speculation as to what he said, but not not a single human being on earth is Jesus Christ. Nor did any human being get inside the mind of Jesus Christ. So to do so... It's just a little bit troubling to try to think that we can. And so when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Only Jesus himself can answer that question to you and me. In fact, I have become, over the years, wary of people who say they've got Jesus all figured out and that everyone else around them is wrong because their understanding of our Lord and Savior is the correct one. Ah, you know, I've got to give them kudos for being that, you know, <laughs> sure of themselves. But I don't think we really have the right or the mind or the spirit to actually, even though we have the Holy Spirit in us, we still cannot assume to know more than Jesus. Regardless, though, these words, this cry, is, it's piercing, isn't it? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is from a man, or as we believe, our Lord and Savior. He had said to his followers, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. He also said to his disciples just before his arrest, I am not alone because the Father is with me. Well, if we look at the Scripture, and I think sometimes we just become so familiar with it that we stop wrestling with it. And by wrestling, I don't mean doubt. I mean certainly just really getting into it. Or maybe wrestling isn't the right word, but to, to study it and to think about it and to appropriate it. When Jesus says, after having said these things to his disciples, and then says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I mean, one of the thoughts is, we could say, is, he, is he just out of it? Is he, is he deluded? Is he maybe holier than thou in, in getting smacked down for uh, his attitude? Some people thought so. We know from the accounts at the crucifixion that there were many people there who found it um, almost amusing that he was there. They, they taunted him. They made fun of him. We just read that, you know, they said, if you're the Son of God, if, if you're who you say you are, save yourself. Other accounts in the Gospels say, come off that cross, you high and mighty. Others said, you're, you're the King of Israel? Come on. Do your stuff. It's so mean and cruel. And yet I can understand to some degree they didn't believe this about him. They were hateful and angry and bitter and confused. But we know, we know he was not deluded, do we not? And we know that he wasn't holier than thou. He was holy. It wasn't a matter of amount. He simply was holy, is holy, the Son of God. We know he's not deluded because this man, by the accounts in the Gospels, by the testimony of the early church, this is a man who turned water into wine at a marriage ceremony. And not just a little bit, but jars and jars and jars. A wine so tasty, so good, that the host remarked about it. This is a man who healed the sick. It says sometimes he healed from morning to, dawn, to dusk and healed everyone who came to him of all kinds of diseases turned lepers clean in an instant, gave people back their sight. We know he wasn't deluded. He could feed thousands of people with a tiny little bit of food. It was a miracle beyond miracle. And we know that he raised people from the dead three times in his ministry. One his friend Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. His sister said, don't open that tomb. It's going to smell. And they opened the tomb and he said, come out. And Lazarus was alive. 
He is not deluded. And yet he cries out, Eli, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now those, you know, you're, you're you know, a Bible study or been in churches, you know, that's, those are words that come straight out of Psalm 22. But he wasn't just saying those words so that people could say, see, it was prophesied. No theologian believes that Jesus just said those words because he knew they were in Psalm 22 and it would fit the circumstances. Not a single that I've read theologian believes that. They believe he called out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that he meant it. It wasn't some act for the people around him. He felt alone. He felt forgotten, disconnected from the source of all goodness and love, his Father. And there are many theories which I will not bore you with today. Isn't that fantastic? What a gift. But I will highlight them quickly for you. There are many theories that theologians bring forward. They call them the theories of atonement. I know you're like, okay, he is going to tell us about it. But again, they'll say there's been a number of them over the centuries. From the very beginning, there was one called Christus Victor. That in the cross, Jesus, and in his resurrection, Jesus had triumphed over sin and death, over the evil in the world. There is also theories that he said he was like he is the Jesus is the new Adam, and where Adam failed, Jesus has gone in full obedience and followed his father and has rectified what Adam has done. And you know what? It's, both of those are good theories. There is also the theory, the atonement theory of satisfaction. That is, that through obedience, Jesus was able to. Um, appease his father. And there's also the one of substitution, that sin is so bad that God just can't let it go away. That somehow there's to be an account of this. And so Jesus takes our place. And this is probably the one that we're may, probably most familiar with in many ways, right? That he takes the sin of the world. John the Baptist thought that. That Jesus... Because God is just and sin cannot be taken away just like that, that Jesus had to pay that price, be put in our place on the cross and die. And then there is the one that is and, and moral influence, that Jesus in his death and his obedience to the Father shows the way of love and of not fighting back, of not participating in the retribution that happens in the world. I mean, these are all good theories. I think there's a bit of everything in, in this story. But I am, I am weary, wary of people who tell me they know exactly what it's all about. The older I get, the less I'm sure of some things. And, and don't get afraid. I... I I'm not losing my faith. I'm just less rigid about things. In some ways, I try not to be holier than thou. Not because I want to be, hey, the guy for everybody. Nope. I just know that holier than thou is often the most unpleasant thing to come across. And so the older I get, the less I claim crystal clear understanding of the, what happened at this cross and how Jesus could call out to his Father, a member of the Trinity, and say, why have you forsaken me? What I do more and more as the years go by is I simply acknowledge that the Gospels view his death as part of God's salvation plan. That that, without a doubt, all the Gospel writers thought that Jesus at the cross 
brought us before a holy and loving God. John the Baptist, his cousin, said of him, Look, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so that's what I focus in on when it comes to the cross. And this I know for sure too. Because Jesus could call out and not be play-acting, but He could call out and say, My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? I know for sure that we worship a God who became one of us. He was as limited in His humanity as we are. I know that sounds preachy, sounds philosophical, but understand that we worship a God who understands us. I mean, right down to the separation from God, to the pain of suffering and of grief. Jesus is not removed or philosophical. He is flesh and blood, even though He is also God, divine. They're mixed together in a way that, again, folks, you're not going to understand. And if you think you do, well, talk to me because the Holy Spirit's been talking to you. Jesus is not human one time and divine another. Depending on the circumstances, He's both. And having that human side, He can understand us. He enters into what we experience and can move us through it. Understanding that God is with us all the way. And I do believe, as in the last theory of atonement I gave, I, I sent you, I do believe that the cross, for all its spiritual beauty and bringing us to God and, and to holiness, I do believe the cross shows the way of love and nonviolence. I mean, that much, at least that much we can take away. That Jesus had every opportunity to say no. <laughs> that he said to the people, do you think I couldn't have legions of angels come down and rescue me? When his, when his disciples struck off, do you remember, struck off one of the ears of one of the temple guards, Jesus said, no, 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 we're not, this is not what we're doing here. This is not how we do things in the kingdom of God. At the very least, which is an odd thing to say because the cross is so monumental, it teaches us to let go of retribution of this sense of payback that guides everything from gossip to outright lies and attacks and retribution. He calls us to a life that says no to that. Let me ask you, is that easy to do? I mean, we got things that we can say, well, I, you know what, no big deal. But does each and every one of us have a trigger <laughs> that says, I'm done. I'm done. I'm fighting back. And what does that do to the world? When everyone has triggers that say, I'm fighting back this time. It would be a different world instead of the world of payback, the broad way, Jesus says, that leads to destruction. Well, you don't have to agree, amazingly, <laughs> with what I'm saying to you today. I don't expect you to, uh, you know, to agree with me that we can't fully understand or that uh, you know, why, why Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I have, the, the older I get to, the less, I, all I want to do is, is inspire. I, I want to be of help. I want to be a, uh, uh, someone who walks with you. Yes, a minister has responsibilities and authority. Absolutely. I don't, I've never, you know, downplayed that. But the older I get, I, I simply... I simply want to love Jesus. And not always say to people, I totally understand Him. And so, at the very least, 
when he yells out, when he calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you at least this much. He was not reciting Scripture for effect. It was real. Think of that for a second. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For that moment, Jesus felt cut off from his heavenly Father. And yes, the evangelical side of me, the more conservative side of me, says with the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders, he was cut off from a holy God. But I have to think simply, is it possible that there are places God cannot go? Are there things we do that God cannot go there in His holiness, in His goodness? I don't know. Psalm 139 tells us that it doesn't matter if I rise to the heavens, you're there. If I go down into the depths, I'm there. The darkest night is like day to you. That's what Psalm 139 says. But Jesus called out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why can I not find you on this cross? Why can I not find you? I don't exactly know. But i got to ask myself, And if you want to ask yourself the same question, I invite you to. Is it wise to think of sin and of doing our own way as harmless? As I've joked around with you, Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Is that so harmless? I prefer to walk, not that I do it all the time. I prefer to walk in God's way of love and obedience, of trust and of hope and of openness to His Word and to what He has called us to do, where we can feel the leading of the Holy Spirit That's what I'm taking for in this scripture today. Christ has shown us. Christ has shown us that we can be disconnected from God. One last little tidbit where Jesus said, really the only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When I was first converted, I used to worry about that. And then I had a friend of mine who was convinced that he had already done that, so he was already going to hell, the blasphemy of the Holy Holy Spirit. Well, I said, well, what is it? He says, I don't know, but I'm sure I've done it. And he was serious. He was serious. I said, dude, like, no, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is that you you so will not believe that you can't hear God. You won't hear him because you don't want to. As C.S. Lewis says, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. And so when Jesus, whether it's the sin of the world on his shoulders, whether it is because God cannot be there, because this is part of the salvation plan, and he says, why have you forsaken me? I know, you know, there is a narrow gate that we can walk through and find life and the Spirit of God 
in everything we do. And he will never forsake you. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for who you are. I, I, my feeble thinking when it comes to this particular scripture is, is no match for the reality of what happened on that day. You did set the world right. You have given us, through your Son, Jesus Christ, unrestricted access to you. No six feet of dis- distance, no masks, no cues, no appointments. You have given us full access to your holiness, to your beauty, to your forgiveness, to your compassion, to your grace, to your generosity, all these things of which the Holy Spirit teaches us, gives us the fruits that you send to us. We thank you, Lord God, for this. We pray for our world that still is reeling in the midst of this pandemic and in which tempers and politics have flared, full throttle. People are all too eager to exclude one another. They are all too eager to think only they are right. They are all too eager to dismiss others almost to the point of denying their humanity. But your way, Lord God, is different. On the cross, we see how foreign (laughs) sin is to God. Help us at least grapple with that. And to take honest stock of what that kind of life, a life that just only serves self, what kind of life that leads to. What kind of a home life it creates. What kind of a community it creates. What kind of a community it does nationally and internationally when only we think of ourselves. how different it would be if we would come to you, die to self, Lord God, in in witness to you to put your kingdom first in everything we do. To allow your beauty and grace and forgiveness and compassion, all these things, to be a part of who we are. Lord, for all of those of us that follow the news and read our blogs and go online and see story after story, sometimes we're overwhelmed by what we see. But I pray that each and every one of us would always start with ourselves. That we would allow you, Lord God, into our own lives and and to guide us away from the, the misery of sin of selfishness, of greed, of pride. To guide us into something bigger, more holy, healthy, kind, and courageous. We pray for everyone, Lord God, even though I say we, it starts with us in our own minds and hearts and homes. We do pray, though, for every person who has oversight over numbers of people. And that grows exponentially with, with uh, the office that person carries 
We pray for them. We pray for our, uh, our municipality, for our counselors. We pray for everyone in Parliament and for our Prime Minister, whether we agree with him or not. We pray, Lord God, that they would listen to you. Listen to your call to love and to grace and to justice. And we pray for the wider world because there are people that you have put in place, Lord God, that have an incredible task ahead of them. I get muddled, Lord God, making the grocery list. We have people doing things that are affecting millions. We pray for them. We pray that when they are working for love and for justice and for peace, that they would have the strength and the guidance to do so. And Lord, but we circle back down to here, to Chatham, to our homes, to our own minds. May we understand that Jesus has paid the price on the cross. He has taken the sin of the world. He has shown us the way of love and of peace. And may that be who we are. And may it be that that speaks louder than our bumper stickers. May it be that they see in us you, Lord Jesus Christ, in the way we speak and in the way we act. Especially when we think no one is looking. May it be. May it be that we love you and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Amen.
Thank you, Adam. I hope you have a really lovely Sunday. It's a nice, nice sun. It's a little chilly still, but I hope that uh, you can find some time to uh, rest and uh, be with those that you're able to be with and that you can connect uh, with through uh, phone or video. I hope this is a, a blessing to you. And may you remember always that as you go, uh, that in whatever happens to you, you have the absolute, true, and certain presence of God through the Father, through the Son, and the Holy Spirit, always. Amen. God bless you, everybody.